The first speaker is going to be David Strauss, PhD, and a very uh, good friend of mine. Uh, Dr. Strauss is associated with microbiology and immunology at Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in Lubbock, Texas. He received his PhD in microbiology from Loyola University in Chicago in 1974 and has done postdoc work at the University of Cincinnati, Cincinnati <clears throat> and the University of Texas Health Sciences Center at San Antonio. He's been a consultant to indoor air research for over 10 years and has served as an expert in litigation involving sick building syndrome. He has published extensively in the field examining the microbiology of indoor air. Dr. Strauss. <clears throat> thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Dr. Hooper. Thank you for inviting me. The uh, topic of my talk, as you can see today, is um, sick building syndrome. <clears throat> and I asked Dennis if I could go first uh, because what I'm going to do is introduce uh, how this all began. And you'll see it goes back a very, very long way. I could also uh, entitle this talk, How I Learned to Love the Fungi, because up until 1994, I had been strictly a bacteriologist for 25 years and really did not know anything about fungi. And even when I was in graduate school, I had never even taken a course in mycology. But as uh, you can all imagine, that changed very, very quickly. And so what I'd like to do is tell you how this all began. The term sick building syndrome was coined by the World Health Organization in 1982. And what it means is, is that people in buildings become sick. It, it's not the building itself that's sick. It means that there's something inside the building that makes people sick. And when uh, the World Health Organization coined the term sick building syndrome in 1982, they really didn't know what caused sick building syndrome. There were many theories, but they really didn't know exactly. So that's the way my life stood <clears throat> until 1994, when an indoor air quality company called QIC came to Texas Tech University and said that they wanted to sponsor uh, research, which means give money, uh, in and figure out what sick causes sick building syndrome. And the president of Texas Tech University at the time was a, was a man named uh, Dr. Robert Lawless. And of course, he said, sure, we'd be happy to take your money, which he did. And um, then, of course, he had to scramble to find someone who could do the research and try to figure out what was causing sick building syndrome. <clears throat> and so they looked around the university, and they looked around the medical school, and there wasn't anybody who knew anything about indoor air. But they did find a Dr. Jim McGrath in the physiology department at the medical school who worked on outdoor air. He looked at pollution in outdoor air and they figured indoor air, outdoor air, how different could they be? So Dr. McGrath, being a typical researcher, he said, sure, I'd be happy to accept the grant because researchers are always looking for money. And then what he did was is he went to all of the different departments in the medical school and asked for one person, because he didn't have a clue about indoor air, so he asked for help for all of the departments in, in the medical school to set up a panel to try to figure out what was causing sick building syndrome. And because I had worked with Dr. McGrath uh, in bacterial lung infections, he asked me to be the microbiology representative. And I said, well, I don't know, I'm, I'm really very busy. And he says, don't worry, you won't have to do anything because we all know microbiology doesn't play any role in sick building syndrome. And I said, okay, if I don't have to do anything, I'm your man. So then finally QIC came back a few months later and, and said to uh, Dr. Lawless and Dr. McGrath, what have you done with our money? And at that point, nothing had been done. So they said, well, let's go look at some buildings and see if you guys can figure out what's going on in these buildings. And of course, no one in the faculty wanted to go. So Jim says, I need you to go look at some buildings because no one else wants to go. And I said, okay, I'll do it. But remember, you told me I wouldn't have to do anything. So I started looking at buildings, and the first thing I noticed was that all of these buildings where people had health complaints, there was water damage. And of course, because there was water damage, there was microbial growth. And remember, I'm not a mycologist, but I could look at these things under the microscope and I knew they weren't bacteria, so I figured this has to be fungi. And indeed, these were fungi growing in these buildings. And therefore, then I wanted to ask the question and really change the course of my research did fungi growing in water damaged buildings cause sick building syndrome? And of course, it does. And I've been giving talks like this for 20 years, and people always ask me, is this something new? I've never heard of this before. 
And this is the way I answer that, qu that question. I quote them a verse from the Bible, the Old Testament. This is Leviticus chapter 14, verses 33 through 45. And what's really interesting about this is that this was written 3,300 years ago. 3,300 years. And this is what it says. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when you enter the land of Canaan, which I'm giving you as your possession, and they put a spreading mildew in the house in that land, the owner of the house must go and tell the priest, I have seen something that looks like mildew in my house. The priest is to order the house to be empty before he goes in to examine the mildew so that nothing in the house will be pronounced unclean. After this, the priest is to go in and inspect the house. He is to examine the mildew on the walls, and if the greenish or reddish depressions that appear to be deeper than the surface of the wall, the priest shall go out of the door of the house and close it up for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest shall return to inspect the house. If the mildew has spread on the walls, he is to order that the contaminated stones be torn out and thrown into an unclean place outside the town. He must have all of the inside walls of the house scraped and the material that is to be scraped off dumped into an unclean, unclean place outside the town. Then they are to take other stones to replace these and take new clay and plaster the house. If the mildew reappears in the house after the stones have been torn out and the house scraped and plastered, the priest is to go and examine it. And if the mildew has spread in the house, it is a destructive mildew. The house is unclean. It must be torn down its stones, timbers, and all the plaster and taken, to, and taken out of the town to an unclean place. Now, isn't that interesting? Because really, this is pretty much what we still do today. Except, <laughs> except we know that getting a priest into the house to try to bless the motorway does not work. Now, you might wonder what microbiologists look like in the time of Leviticus. And I was <laughs> fortunate enough to find a picture of a trio of my early microbiologists. And you can see that this is clearly before uh, von Leeuwenhoek uh, invented the microscope in, six, in 1650. So obviously, at the time of Leviticus, the microscope had not been invented. So these guys had to get really close to their petri dishes to be able to see what they were looking at. OK, so what is sick building syndrome? Well. It's a late term, it's a compilation of symptoms, and the symptoms that people report in what we call sick buildings are itchy eyes, nausea, congestion, scratchy throats, fatigue, headaches, and a decreased attention span. And normally people, when they leave a building, they say, boy, I sh sure feel much better now that I'm not in that building anymore. These increased respiratory tract infections include such things as cold, sore throats, ear infections, pneumonia and sinus infection, and when I began this work in 1994, the obvious question was, can fungal products induce or cause the symptoms that I've just described? Now, it's taken a long time. In fact, when we first got into the field, um, many scientists and many federal organizations refused to believe that mold growing in, in buildings could cause any type of illness at all. And it wasn't until 2002 till we finally convinced the uh, Center for Disease Control, the CDC, that indeed mold growing in buildings can make people sick. And they came out with a uh, white paper by Dr. Red, and they admitted that indeed mold growing in buildings can cause three things. Allergic rhinitis, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and asthma exacerbation. They gave us that. So I'd like to talk about the first two now because I'm going to talk about asthma a little bit later. Allergic rhinitis, as most of you know, is a type 1 uh, immediate hypersensitivity reaction. The symptoms are congestion, sneezing, itching of eyes, clogged ears, irritated nose and throat. It's an allergic reaction of the nasal passages, and of course it's mediated by IgE. And these symptoms sound an awful lot like what people in, in sick buildings complain of. If you think of this green dot as a spore, of course people inhale fungal spores. There's IgE on mast cells, the fungal spore binds to the IgE, the mast cells release histamine, and people have an allergic reaction. And you get post-nasal drip, clear nasal discharge, and inflamed nasal lining. So that's really pretty easy to understand. It's not difficult to, to imagine that the inhalation of fungal spores can cause allergic rhinitis. Another thing that fungal spore inhalation can cause is called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And this is a much more serious consequence of the inhalation of fungal spores. As you can see, the symptoms are dry cough, shortness of breath, appetite loss, weight loss, and fatigue. And, and this is much more serious than just sneezing. And this is due to the sensitization and recurrent exposure to inhaled particles. But the one thing that's very important to remember is these are not just inert particles. Fungal spores are alive, and we have been able to show that not only do we react against fungal spores when we inhale them, but they react against us. They produce compounds while they're in our lungs. 
This can affect uh, the terminal bronchioles and the alveoli. You can get inflammation, granulomas, and it can progress to fibrosis, making uh, destruction of lung tissue a possibility and, of course, increasing the difficulty in breathing. All right, so this is the equation now. This is what happens when buildings get into trouble. And it's a very, very simple equation, as you can see. It's food and water and spores equal growth. Now, the, building, the buildings are fungal food. We build most of our buildings out of cellulose, which is the most abundant organic material in the world. Therefore, it's very, very cheap. So most buildings have a tremendous amount of cellulose in them. It's organic food for mold. Fungal spores are everywhere. They're on the desktop. They're floating around the air inside and outside. So the fungal spores, we can't avoid, uh, avoid them. They're always going to be inside of buildings. So, of course, the way we make sure buildings do not get into trouble is make sure buildings do not get wet. But you try telling that to the people who experience Katrina or Sandy or any type of tremendous water damage or even just a water leak. Buildings get wet all of the time. And, of course, when they do, the building is food, the fungal spores are already there, and, of course, the water promotes fungal growth. So what I'd like to do now is introduce you to the cast of characters that, that you're going to hear much more about in various talks today, you're going to hear about a lot of different organisms, and I'd like to show you what, what uh, these organisms look like. I'm going to show you some data from a book called Medically Important Fungi, A Guide to Identification. This is by um, D.H. Lerone. And this is cladosporium. And, and the point I'm going to make here is that a trained mycologist can look at a spore, which of course is what these are, and look at the spore and tell you what the genus and even maybe even sometimes the species, but more likely the genus of the organism that this spore represents. And cladosporium spores are about five to seven microns in size, and you can see they're blunted on their polar ends. This is what penicillium looks like, and penicillium comes uh, from the Latin penicillus, which means brush, and indeed, if you look at this structure here, it looks, it looks like a brush, and that's where the organism gets its name. The scientific name for spores is conidia, as you see here, and this structure here is the phyllid, which produces the spores. That was a schematic. All right, let me just go back and just show you what our uh, point was. You see the cladosporium spores, and you see how tremendously different penicillium spores are from cladosporium spores. And that's how we tell the difference when we look at them under the microscope. That was a schematic. This is an actual electron micrograph of what penicillium spores look like. And you can see individual spores. Here's one, and here, and here's another. And they're usually in very long chains. Here's a penicillium species that produces little hooks on the surface of the spores, and you can see them. And so if an animal or a human being even brushes up against the colony, the spores then can adhere to that individual's clothing, and the spores can be moved from point A to point B, which is exactly what the spores want to do. Now, this is a really interesting electron micrograph that I found that I wanted to uh, include in the talk. What this is, what this brown surface here is, this, that's bread. And you can see the penicillium, the penicillus, the brush, and, and you can look. Here's an individual spore. And if you look at this picture very, very closely, you see thousands and thousands of penicillium spores. So if you take a bread out of the cupboard and it's got mold growing on it, it's blue and green, if you had an electron microscope, you could see, uh, and this is what you would see. This organism is called Altenaria, and this organism is important in asthma. It's probably the most important asthma-producing uh, fungus. It's called Altenaria because <clears throat> the spores alternate from the thin portion of the spore here. Like here, here's a spore. The thin portion of the spore goes to the thick portion of the next spore, so it alternates. And so that's why that organism is called Altenaria. Now here's a really interesting group uh, of organisms, and these are called the Aspergillus. And you're going to hear much more about these organisms today. This is Fumigatus, Aspergillus Fumigatus, Niger, Flavus, and Versicolor. Fumigatus produces a toxin called gliotoxin, which can attack the central nervous system. But what's really interesting about these organisms, and you'll hear more about them today, is that the mycotoxins that Flavus and Versicolor produce are carcinogens. They cause human cancer. They cause liver cancers. So this particular toxin is called aflatoxin, which you'll hear a great deal about today. And the toxin produced by Versicolor is called sterigmatocystin, which, and these are known liver carcinogens. So now we've got cancer involved in all of this, not, not just the presence of mycotoxins, but mycotoxins that can cause cancer. This is what a fruiting structure of Aspergillus looks like. And here is the head, the fruiting head, and you can see the spores or the conidia on the outside of this structure. But what's really neat that these organisms can do is this. They fire their spores 
into the air. So look at that. That's, that's what's happening here. And I'll show you in the next picture a really interesting fruiting structure. But aspergillus can fire, like little cannons, fire their spores into the air. And this is exactly what you see here. Here's an aspergillus fruiting structure. And you can see this three spores here. But look at this structure here. And look at this one here. These are empty cannons. They've fired their spores. These are the phyllids. And they've already fired their spores. And that's how most of the spores from aspergillus could get into the air. As I told you, we can carry these spores around on our clothing. And what you're looking at here is aspergillus niger on cloth. You can see the strands of cloth. And then if you look closely between the strands, you see aspergillus spores. So we can carry spores around on our clothing from one point to another. Now this is a really interesting organism. This is an organism that, that may of you, many of you may not have heard much about. This organism is called Chitomium. And this organism is different than the other organisms that I've talked about in that it produces its spores in a structure called an ascus. So what you're looking at here, this whole structure here is called a parathecium, or parathecia is plural. And it looks like a hairy tennis ball. Here's the round ascus, and then these fibers that come off of it. And then if you look over here, you see uh, chitomium ascospores. And they're called ascospores because they're produced in an ascus, which is what this is, and they come out in this huge mass of spores. This is why it's very difficult to clean chitomium spores off of things, is because the spores are protected inside this ascus structure. Here's what the ascus spores of chitomium look like. You can see their um, lemon-shaped structures. They're about five to seven microns in size. Here's a close-up of chitomium, uh, chitomium globosum ascus spores. And as I say, here's an entire spore or conidium, and they're about five to seven microns in size. Here are some parathecia, and this structure here is called an osteole. It's the hole that the uh, spores come out of. When, when the parathecium is ready to release its mass of spores, they come out of this hole right here called the osteum. And here are some more uh, chitomium spores. Now, chitomium is particularly dangerous, and the reason it is is because once it gets in the bloodstream, it is capable of crossing the blood-brain barrier and getting to the brain, and this is what you're looking at here. This is chitomium growing in the human brain. Uh, upon autopsy. So most commonly you'll see chitomium infections in, in people who are immunocompromised or even drug users because drug users don't sterilize their needles and they don't sterilize their skin. So when they inject themselves, if there's chitomium around, which there very well could be, they inject that right into the bloodstream and this organism is capable of crossing the blood-brain barrier. All right, so here's the organism that you've all heard the most about. And I think it's the neatest of all of the fungi uh, that cause problems in buildings. And this, of course, is Stachybotrys. And Stachybotrys is called the black mold because it produces black spores. And these spores are black because they produce the pigment melanin. And that gives these spores its color. And you can see uh, the phyllid here that produces the spore. So what I'm going to do now is show you a really interesting paper that, that will um, give you a very good idea of what Stachybotrys is capable of doing. This is a paper by Dill et al. It's called Mass Development of Stachybotrys Tartarum Plant Pots Made of Recycling Paper, published in uh, 1997 in the journal Mycoses. And let me just set it up before I show you what uh, the next slide is going to show. There was a group of women in a small town in Germany who began to feel sick, and they would have desquamation of their hands and face, skin falling off their hands and face. And the one thing that all these women had in common is that they all worked in the same place. And so they sent an epidemiologist to this place, which happened to be a nursery, not, not of infants, but of plants. And the epidemiologist walked into the nursery, and this is what he saw. And he said, aha, this is your problem. These pots are made out of cellulose, which, of course, is paper, organic material. And as you can imagine, the plants get watered. So these pots stay wet all of the time. And now if you look closely at these pots, what you're looking at here are incredibly large stachybotrys colonies. Look at the size of them. And this pot here is almost an entirely a stachybotrys colony. And then you see a large stachybotrys colony on this pot, and there's some more over here. So if you look at these pots up close, you see large stachybotrys colonies on the pots, and even small stachybotrys colonies on the pots, will, which will become large stachybotrys colonies given enough time and water. So obviously what was happening was is the women were picking up these pots with bare hands, grabbing the stachybotrys colonies, 
The trichothecene mycotoxins are on the colonies, which I'm going to show you a, bit, a little bit later. They transfer it to their hands. The trichothecene mycotoxins kill cells by inhibiting protein synthesis. They touch their face, they transfer the mycotoxin to their face. So this nursery just switched to clay pots and that problem went away. So this is what Stachybotrys actually looks like. You can see once again the black spores. This is why it's called uh, the black mold. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the killer mold, which I think is ridiculous, and even the toxic mold, which I, which I particularly don't like. But certainly this organism can be called the black mold because indeed, as you'll see, that's what the colonies look like. And you can see here, here's an example of some phyllids which produce the spores. And this is the structure of the, uh, the simple structure of trichothecene mycotoxins. There are simple and there are macrocyclic trichothecenes. This happens to be a simple. The molecular weight of these things is around 250. If you think of an oxygen molecule, the molecular weight is 16. So you can see that about 20 times the size of an oxygen molecule. So these things are very, very small and they're incredibly stable. So it's not surprising then to, to find out, as we did, that these mycotoxins actually float around in the air in stachybotrys infested buildings. So what I'd like to do now is just tell you how important these trichothecene mycotoxins are. And I'm going to do that by showing you a chapter in a book. And what's really interesting about this book is it's called Textbook of Military Medicine, Medical Aspects of Chemical and Biological Warfare Weapon, Weapons. And if you look, the Department of the United States Army feels that trichothecene toxins are biological warfare weapons. Now, if that doesn't catch your attention, I don't know what would. This is what the trichothecenes can do uh, in nanogram concentrations. That's 10 to the minus ninth of a gram, just an incredibly small amount can do this. This is 200 nanograms, 100 nanograms, 50, and 25 injected into the back of a hairless guinea pig. In one, 24 hours, you see this. 48 hours, you see this. This is one week. And then you see after two weeks, uh, the lesions have been resolved. So what I'd like to do now is tell you why these toxins are important to the, to the understanding of sick building syndrome. This table it shows the comparative toxicity of T2, which is a macrocyclic trichothecene, a very dangerous trichothecene, by various routes of administration. And I'll explain to you why this is a very important slide um, for your patients. What you're looking at here, these data are listed in LD50s, which is milligram per kilogram of body weight. So the smaller the number, the more potent is the route of delivery of the toxin. And I'll just go down the column of the rat because, as you can see, that's the one that they filled in entirely. And you can see that the, the most um, dangerous or most effective way of delivering trichothecene mycotoxins to the rat to kill 50% of a population is intracerebral injection, which means, of course, you take a needle and you inject it into the animal's brain. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, that does not happen in sick building syndrome. There's no one in these buildings injecting these toxins into the brains of anybody in these buildings. But this is what does happen. The second most potent way of introducing these toxins into rat is inhalational. And believe me, that's exactly what happens in sick building syndrome. We've shown that the mycotoxins can float around in the air. And of course, if they float around in the air, people inhale them. And Dr. Hooper is capable of measuring these trichothecene concentrations in individuals. And believe me, this is what happens. The mycotoxins are in the air and people inhale them. And you, and you can imagine then what happens to these people because these things are considered biological warfare weapons. All right, so here in this slide, and this is, this is also really neat because it will show you the importance of stachybotrys. This is relative acute parental, parental just means an injection uh, around the body, toxicity of the most abundant trichothecene mycotoxins, and this is also LD50s, milligram per kilogram of body weight, and I want to put, just point out three mycotoxins on this table. This one here, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide, is called anguidine. It is a simple trichothecene. But the ones I want you to look at here are Roritin A and Satrotoxin H. So if you look at the mouse, which is the only one that's completely filled in, remember the lower the number, the more potent is the toxin. The most potent trichothecene toxins are these two right here. And these are produced by stachybotrys. So the most potent trichothecene mycotoxins are the ones that stachybotrys produces. Okay, so interestingly enough, we know what these trichothecene mycotoxins do to human beings. 
because they've been injected into human beings. And you might say, well, why would anyone in their right mind inject trichothecenes into human beings? Well, the idea was, is because these are protein synthesis inhibitors, the idea was in, in, in liver cancer patients, terminal liver cancer patients, the hope was is that the toxins would slow down the rapidly uh, multiplying cell population in the tumor and leave the rest of that individual's cells alone. That's what, that was the hope. This is what happened. Phase one and phase two clinical evaluations, and this is anguidine, also known as anguidine, which is the one I showed you in the previous slide, was injected into patients with cancer, and studies were in the late 1970s. It disclosed significant toxicity with intravenal doses, 0 0.077 milligrams per kilogram of body weight was what was injected. It was injected daily for five days, particularly in patients with hepatic metastases. And this is what the people complained of it. They complained of nausea, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, burning erythema, ataxia, chills, fever, hypertension, hair loss, and mental confusion. And you may have seen those things in some of your patients. The anti-tumor activity of the trichothecenes was minimal or absent in these patients, so its use was discontinued. So we know what these trichothecenes do to human beings because we have data that show us what happens. So then you would ask, what types of health effects do people who live, work, or go to school in sick buildings or stachybotrys infested buildings, what do they complain of? They complain of nausea, rashes, or burning erythema, desquamation, I showed you the desquamation study already, hair loss, dizziness, vomiting, confusion, memory loss, weakness or loss of energy, and mucosal bleeding. So if we compare those data to what, was, uh, what were observed in the 78-79 study, you can see nausea, rashes or burning erythema, desquamation, hair loss, dizziness, vomiting, and weakness or loss of energy are related from the studies of 1979-1978 to what we commonly see in stachybotrys infested buildings today. Okay, so what I'd like to do now I think I've, I've said enough about the trichothecene mycotoxins. I'd like to go back now to the third thing that the CDC admits that mold growing in buildings can do, and that is cause asthma exacerbation. But in order to understand uh, how these spores get into the lungs, you have to understand the size of the spores because the sizes are all different. The shapes are different, as I showed you. So here you see in this slide the relationship of spore size and the human respiratory system. And the very large spores, greater than seven microns, really don't make it even into the upper or the lower respiratory tract. Five to seven microns make their way to the pharynx. Three to five microns get to the trachea and the primary bronchi. Two to three microns get to the secondary bronchi. One to two microns get to the terminal bronchi. And then the spores around one to two uh, microns in size will make all their way all the way down to the alveoli where, of course, oxygen exchange occurs. So then the relationship to spore size also tells you how long a particular spore will stay in the air. You may have heard or read that it's very difficult to find stachybotrys spores in the air. And, and that's true for two reasons. First of all, the stachybotrys spore is a very large spore. And stachybotrys colonies require a great deal of water. So the spores are usually wet, adding to their weight. So it's very difficult to find stachybotrys spores in the air. But it doesn't mean that the mycotoxins aren't there, because indeed we have shown in buildings where there are no stachybotrys spores in the air, but stachybotrys actually growing on building surfaces, you can detect the trichothecene mycotoxins in the air. So most of the fungal spores that you're going to see in the air are penicillium, aspergillus, and cladosporium spores, and I've listed the, the sizes of them for you here. Penicillium and aspergillus spores are relatively small spores, so they float around in the air on wind currents. And about a third of all of the penicillin spores are very, very small. Therefore, they can get all the way down to the bottom of the lungs. As regards the size of these particles, the very large particles, greater than 20 microns, just falls out of the air very quickly. Stachybotrys spores fall out of the air very quickly. 10 to 20 microns can stay airborne for 100 seconds. 5 to 10 microns can stay airborne for 1,000 seconds. 2 to 5 microns can stay airborne for 10,000 seconds. And the penicillium and aspergillus spores, they just continue to float around. Air currents are enough to float them around because they are very small and very light. So this is a really interesting slide. It's a very old slide, but it needs to be old to show you what's happening with asthma in the United States today. This slide, the source is the American Lung Association. And what the American Lung Association noticed, of course, is that asthma is increasing dramatically. 
in the United States. When I was a kid in grade school, I never saw an inhaler. Now I understand inhalers are very common in grade schools because there are many kids that have asthma. And if you notice, then this increase began in 1982, exactly when the World Health Organization described the phenomenon of sick building syndrome. And as you can see here, researchers are struggling to explain asthma's dramatic increase. So in 1982, there were about 8 million cases. If you carry this all the way out, I, I looked these data up, and in 2009, there were 25 million cases of asthma. About 1 in 12 people have it. So you can, as you can see, asthma continues to increase in this country, and it's not known why. Okay, so let's talk about asthma because the CDC says inhaling fungal spores can exacerbate asthma. It was first referred to by Hippocrates in 400 BC, and it was described in detail in the second century as facial anxiety, rapid, noisy respirations, fear of suffocation, and scant, foamy expectoration. And asthma comes from the Greek word panting. We now know that asthma uh, is an inflammatory problem. There, so now there is a call for a uh, new initiative for asthma, a new definition, a new approach. Asthma, of the, regardless of its severity, is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways. Airway inflammation is associated with airway hyperresponsiveness, airflow limitations, and respiratory symptoms. Airway inflammation produces four forms of airway limitation, acute bronchoconstriction, swelling of the airway wall, chronic mucus plug formation, and airway wall remodeling. An atopy the predisposition for developing an IgE-mediated response to common environmental allergens is the strongest identifiable predisposing factor for developing asthma. So this, of course, is what happens in asthma. And if you think of this as a normal bronchiole and the white portion is the airway, all of you who have healthy lungs, this is what your bronchioles look like, a nice large airway. In asthma, you see uh, obstruction, at least partially, which is at least partially reversible, hyperreactivity, and inflammation. And then this is what happens in asthma. This is a normal bronchiole, but in asthma, it's an inflammatory reaction to the inhalation of something. You get bronchospasms, edema, lymphocytes, inflammatory lymphocytes, eosinophils, and mast cells, causing that airway to shrink dramatically, therefore, of course, making it very difficult to breathe. So what then are the environmental triggers for asthma? They are these, dust mites, pollen, Cat dander, in reality, it's not so much dander, but cats, as you know, lick their fur. And when they lick their fur, they put salivary proteases on their fur. And when you stroke the cat, you throw those salivary proteases up into the air, and that's what you wind up inhaling. And then the fourth thing is what I've been talking about for the past half an hour or so, and that is the inhalation of fungal spores. And as I told you, Altenaria, which is what you're looking at here, is probably the most important fungus in asthma exacerbation. Now, tonight, when you go to sleep, I want everybody to think about this. <laughs> Dust mites eat human skin cells. That's what they eat. And, and guess where the highest collection of human skin cells is in your house? Who knows? Pillow. The pillow, because as you sleep, you rub your face on the pillow, you scrape off human skin cells. These little guys, that's where they live. And they eat human skin cells, and of course, anything living that eats already organic material, got to poop. So they defecate in your pillow, and in their uh, fecal material is a protein called DERP1, which is extremely allergenic and is a very, very important cause of asthma, uh, asthma exacerbation. So think about that tonight as you go to sleep. They're not, this, they're not this big. You can't see them, but they're there. All right, so what I'd like to do now is take you back really to the beginning of the research that uh, my lab has done. And this is a paper, this is Cooley et al., um, we published this in 1998. It was the first paper we published, and it got a great deal of worldwide attention. And the reason was it was that because it was the first paper that showed a correlation be between the prevalence of certain fungi and the phenomenon that I've been telling you about. And the reason that we could get um, statistical data on buildings was the fact that the indoor air quality company that I told you about, QIC, gave us access to 48 different buildings. So we were able to not just do one building and fix one building and see what happened. We were able to do it in 48 buildings. And so we were able to get statistical significance as to the importance of fungi growing in buildings. So if you look at this table, it is the incidence per 100 employees of reported complaints and symptoms regarding indoor air quality 
at 48 United States schools between 1994 and 1996. And if you look at the symptoms of what people complain about in these buildings, they're just what I've been telling you about. Nasal drainage and congestion, uh, itchy and watery eyes, uh, headaches, sinus problems, increased airway infections, and allergies. Just exactly what you'd expect people in a fungally contaminated building to be complaining of. Their uh, discomfort complaints were odors and temperature problems. And we asked them, when did these symptoms begin? And they say, as soon as I walk in that building, I begin to feel it. And we say, well, when do these symptoms go away? And they say, as soon as I leave that building, I feel a lot better. But some people said, we never felt better after we leave this bu these buildings. And my feeling is, is these are people that have inhaled mycotoxins. Because once you leave a building and you inhale mycotoxins, the mycotoxins don't leave your body, of course. They stay in the lungs and are distributed throughout the body. When are the symptoms the worst? And of course, they said, when the humidity is high. And that's probably due to the fact that in high humidity, water can uh, con uh, condense out of the air on building surfaces and allow for mold to grow. But the most important data uh, in this slide are these last two lines. And you see that in these 48 buildings, about one third of the people comp had health complaints about the building. They all said, there's something wrong with this building. Almost a third of the people in these buildings. But when we fix these 48 buildings, and that can be very time consuming and very expensive, and then we uh, examined these people again, they said, we feel much better. In fact, the complaint profile now dropped down to 2.5% as opposed to 31%. And, and I will tell you that you will never find a building where everybody's happy. It just doesn't happen. And in fact, even a perfectly good building, 2% of the people in that building are going to say, I hate this building, there's something wrong with it. So we were very happy that we could get about a third of the complaint profile back down to what we considered to be baseline. Okay, so if you look at the bar graph of all of the air samples that we took at these 48 buildings, and if you look up here, the outdoor air is gray, the indoor air and in the complaint area is white, and the indoor air in the non-complaint area is black. And I'll explain that to you because I'm sure you've all seen extremely large buildings. And in these very, very large buildings, you can have water damage in one part of the building. People can have complaints there. But in other parts of the building, people say, I don't know what their problem is. I think this building is fine. So there can be large buildings where there are complaint areas and non-complaint areas, and that's what we found. So if you look then at cladosporium, which I've shown you already what it looks like, you can see that cladosporium is the dominant organism uh, in the outdoor air, much higher in the outdoor air than it is in the indoor air, in the uh, complaint areas or the indoor air <coughs> in the non-complaint areas. But the important part of this particular figure is this one right here. And that is, in buildings where people have health problems, penicillium is usually the dominant organism in the indoor air because it's growing somewhere in the building. So you can see then, in all these 48 schools, the amount of penicillium in the complaint areas was higher than it was in the outdoor air and even in the non-complaint areas. This then is a bar graph of all of the air samples taken at the 20 schools where penicillium species were the dominant fungi. So of those 48 buildings, we found 20 schools that had penicillium as the dominant organism in the indoor air. So this is what you're looking at here. Cladosporium species is in the gray, penicillium is white, and the other fungi are black. And so you can see here, in the outdoor air samples, cladosporium is far and away the dominant organism in the outdoor air, which it should be. Cladosporium should always be the dominant organism in the outdoor air. But in the indoor air and the complaint areas, now you can see penicillium is the dominant organism in the indoor air. In the complaint areas and in the indoor air and the non-complaint areas, you can see that penicillium is not the dominant organism, even inside the building in what we call the non-complaint areas. Okay, the last um, series of experiments I'd like to show you is, is really quite interesting because what I wanted to know with this experiment was, is when a building gets sick, does it stay sick and get better, or does it continually just stay uh, giving health problems? So I had access to a hotel room in a hotel here in Dallas. And the hotel was very happy to have uh, us come to look at these rooms because they had rooms in this hotel that people would stay in one night and they would say, I'm never staying in that room again. So they gave me access to one of these rooms and the beauty of this room was it was on the fifth floor, 
and it had a sliding glass door between the balcony to go outside and, and the room itself. So I could take indoor air samples in, inside that room and immediately walk outside and take outdoor air samples. All I had to do was open and close the sliding glass door. So I could compare the indoor air and the outdoor air in this particular room. So I walked into the room and it was very clear why no one wanted to stay in this room because the, the walls were pink. And we've learned that when there's wallpaper on a wall and there's water behind that wallpaper, penicillium will grow and produce a pink color. So it's very easy to see uh, the problems in these types of rooms. So then, I've explained the experiment to you, and what you're looking at here are fungal concentrations measured in the indoor and the outdoor air. And, of course, the uh, gray here are the outdoor air samples, and the dark are the indoor air samples. And you can see then that in the outside air samples, Cladosporium was the dominant organism, but in the inside of this room, penicillium was the dominant organism in the air. And, of course, the reason was is because it was growing in the room. And I've shown you that when these fungi grow on building surfaces, they release their spores into the air where they can be inhaled. So in this particular room then, I was able to measure the fungal spores in the air. And it won't surprise you at all, this is 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, noon, 1, 2, and 3. And then I had a flight at 4, so I could take six hours worth of samples. And you can see that at every time period inside that room, penicillium was the dominant organism in the indoor air. It didn't go up, didn't go down. It stayed completely constant, as you can see here. But in the outside air, the outside air changes continually. And you if you look here, once again, it's uh, 10, 11, noon, 1, 2, and 3. You can see that at 10 o'clock, Cladosporium was the dominant organism in the outdoor air. At 11 o'clock, Penicillium was. Penicillium was a dominant organism at noon. And then at 1, 2, and 3, Cladosporium became the dominant organism. And of course, that makes sense because the wind's continually blowing in new spores and blowing out old spores, but that's not what happens in the room. In the room, the fungal profile in the air remains the same. So about uh, the year 2000, um, sick building syndrome, the discovery of sick building syndrome was becoming a big deal. And Time Magazine did a story which we helped them write, and they said, send us a picture explaining what causes sick building syndrome. And this is what I sent them, and this is what they published. This is a Petri dish, and this is a penicillium colony, and here's one, two, three, four other penicillium colonies. And of course, you now know that these are Stachybotrys colonies because Stachybotrys produces black colonies. And essentially what I believe goes on in these types of buildings is two important things. Organisms like penicillium and aspergillus produce their spores, fill the air with their spores, which, which people inhale, which cause respiratory tract problems. And then of course, the Stachybotrys is growing on building surfaces the mycotoxins get into the air where people can inhale them, and we've shown this, we've published it, so we know that it happens. Stachybotrys growing in buildings produces the mycotoxins that I've told you about. They're thrown into the air where they can be inhaled. All right, now I'll just show you what these organisms look like. Here are three cladosporium colonies. This is a penicillium colony, so you can see that the colonies have very different uh, morphological shapes. This is the cladosporium colony at the top, cladosporium colony at the bottom. So it's very easy to look at a cladosporium colony and tell what it is because the bottom is just as dark as the top. Not so with penicillium. This is penicillium the top, penicillium the bottom. And you can see the color uh, doesn't exist like it does in the cladosporium colony. This is Aspergillus niger the top, Aspergillus niger the bottom. And you can see the bottom of Aspergillus colonies are not dark. This is Stachybotrys the top, Stachybotrys the bottom. This is a penicillium. Interestingly enough, not all fungi produce colored colonies. This is a white penicillium colony, the top, a penicillium colony, the bottom. All right, then. Mold can grow on building surfaces if these building surfaces become wet. This is cladosporium growing on ceiling tile. Ceiling tile is organic material. Ceiling tile gets wet, mold's going to grow on it. In fact, it's very difficult to stop it from growing. This is um, sheetrock. Sheetrock is a calcium sulfate sandwich. Paper on the outside, calcium sulfate on the inside. Mold, of course, grows on the paper because it's organic material. So when sheetrock gets wet, mold is going to grow on it. This is fiberglass. Now you say, well, how can mold grow on fiberglass? Fiberglass is inorganic. Well, all we had to do was put organic material on the fiberglass, which you can't see, but of course the mold can. And you can see cladosporium growing 
on inorganic material. All right, so this, this, is, this is what I've been leading up to. This is what happens in buildings that get wet. This is a room of a college student who went away for the summer, and the college student in the room above him went away for the summer and probably left the water running or there was a pipe leak. And this is what happens in three months. And just look at the size of that stachybotrys colony. And, well, this is all stachybotrys. And as you can imagine, that individual would have trouble sleeping. <laughs> all right, we're now back to 3,300 years ago. I, I hope now that you uh, have learned how this begins. And I think you'll hopefully appreciate greatly the, the talks that are to follow. Uh, these are uh, some of my students at PhDs in, in, the, uh, in the lab. For those of you who know about the Brazel paper, Dr. Hooper, this is Trevor Brazel right there. Um, Dr. Danny Cooley was the first graduate student I had. Unfortunately, he, he has passed on. Here are some other um, PH, uh, PhD students in the lab. And um, the funding, QIC was the indoor air quality company that funded this research. They later changed their name to Assured Indoor Air Quality, but they are no longer in business. And I know I'm not taking questions now, so I thank you very much for your attention.